All right, um, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back. This is the Dharma Doors, and I'm MC Owens, and you're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight we're going to continue our Sunday Night Sutra study, and we're going to continue with our reading and our kind of study of the Upaya Kushalya Sutra, the Sutra on Skillful Means. Um, <clears throat> so we've kind of been working on this sutra for a little while and kind of been moving through it a little slowly in that way. And tonight we're going to kind of, you know, definitely go much further in the text. I have a few things to say before we dive back in, though, sort of things that were left over from last week and just some ideas that I kind of want to mention. So this sutra that we're going to be, that we've been looking at, that we're going to look at, so it's all about this idea of upaya, and we've spent now six Sunday nights talking about skillful or expedient, which is a way of translating upaya. So skillful, expedient, giving, skillful or expedient discipline, skillful or expedient patience. And basically what we've been going through are the practices of a bodhisattva, which are called the paramitas. And We've been looking at the paramitas, not just in terms of their practice, but how to practice them skillfully. And so as a way to sort of wrap up that conversation, tonight's topic is actually just skillful means. So the idea of upaya, because upaya means skillful means. But what I mean to say, though, is, is that in the first session, Many weeks ago, we I talked about skillful ways of giving. And then again, we moved to moral discipline, patience, and then determination, and then meditation. How, how do you meditate skillfully? How does the bodhisattva meditate skillfully? And then the last one that we talked about last week was skillful wisdom, the implementation of skillful wisdom. All of those were examples of upaya, but tonight we want to talk about skillful means and what that means, what we mean by that is we want to kind of look at the bodhisattva, the bodhisattva practice that in a way uses anything and everything to accomplish the great enlightenment in that sense. So by any means possible is sort of the, the theme for tonight in that sense, by, by any skillful means possible. Um, so we're going to talk about that. But again, I kind of want to bring us up to speed with where, what we've talked about in the sutra. So really quickly, without going kind of all the way back to the beginning, I chose this sutra because I wanted to talk about upaya. You know, I've been talking about the bodhisattva path now for many, many months. And a big part of the bodhisattva path that distinguishes it from the earlier form of Buddhism, the more ascetic, monastic path, upaya is really one of the aspects of the bodhisattva path. And so I wanted to do a whole series on upaya, and I wanted to talk about the sutra. But I didn't quite realize something about this sutra. I, I'd read it before, but I think it just didn't, you know, I didn't make the connection. And what it is, is that at least the first part of this sutra, the, the sutra is divided into, I think, two major parts. The entire first part of this sutra, again, I didn't quite realize this, is entirely dedicated to the topic of sexuality. It's a coming at this idea of sexuality from a lot of different angles. And so 
again, what I didn't really realize is that this sutra is about the bodhisattva's relationship to sexuality. Now, we could extend that and we could use the language of the sutra itself because it would be about the bodhisattva's relationship to the five sensual pleasures, All right? So that's the language that the sutra uses, but it keeps coming back to the topic of sexuality. And <clears throat> we're gonna pick up with the story that we've been, we've been kind of talking about this same story for a while now. And what it is, is it's a story about a bodhisattva named King Honored by All right? Must have been a really nice, nice guy, right? King honored by all. And the story that I, that is in the sutra is about how the young monk, the, the young ascetic monk named Ananda, the, the Buddha's young cousin, saw the bodhisattva king honored by all sitting on a couch with a woman. And that, of course, in the world of early Buddhism that Ananda represents, that's a no-no. Monks, or in that sense, practitioners of the Dharma, according to Ananda, are not supposed to cohort with members of the opposite sex or members of sexual, uh, basically members, people that they would be attracted to. There's supposed to be a distance there. So Ananda basically outs the bodhisattva for having sat on the couch with this woman. Now, the first thing I want to mention is that I misspoke last week, and Noe caught me on that, and I pre always appreciate Noe's careful attention. I misspoke because I thought that the bodhisattva king honored by all had actually slept with the woman, but he didn't. And I said he did. And the reason why I, I realized the reason why I misconstrued that is because what happens is, is this, Ananda calls out the bodhisattva, goes running to the Buddha <clears throat> and saying, hey, I saw a bodhisattva so-and-so. And it turns out that Ananda didn't really know what was going on, that there was kind of a backstory to the Bodhisattva sitting down with the woman, and that ultimately, the Bodhisattva, their only intention was to teach the Dharma to this woman. And so they sat on a couch together, and he recited her a poem that sort of inspired her to become a Bodhisattva inspired her to seek awakening. And the kind of moral of the story <clears throat> is that basically the error <clears throat> or the fault was with Ananda, not Bodhisattva king honored by all. And the reason why Ananda was sort of at fault is because he was calling out somebody else's transgression when they hadn't transgressed. So then there's kind of this reversal. Now, the reason why I misconstrued and thought that the Bodhisattva and the woman had actually slept together is because they were talking about how the Bodhisattva in that situation did not commit a heavy transgression. But what it says is, is that a Bodhisattva who seems to or even actually does break the prohibition against sexuality doesn't incur a heavy transgression. Now, this bodhisattva apparently didn't actually have sexual relationships with the woman, but it's kind of saying even if he did, if the intention was pure, then it wouldn't be a heavy transgression. So I misspoke. I pulled an Ananda. I did it. I misspoke against Bodhisattva King honored by all. So my apologies for that. Now, one thing that I want to add to 
the discussion from last week about all of this, I want to make it clear that what was discussed was this idea that uh, that's where it's on, on the wrong page. It's this idea that a bodhisattva, and now I'm reading from the sutra again, a bodhisattva who has achieved such a compassionate mind, like bodhisattva king honored by all who had the utmost compassion for this woman, <clears throat> a bodhisattva who has achieved such a compassionate mind commits no heavy transgressions even if he enjoys the five sensual pleasures. He's free from all transgressions and from all karmas leading to the miserable planes of existence. So I want to make something clear that I didn't make clear last week. This sutra is not saying that a bodhisattva has free license to have sexual relations or free license to just indulge in the sensual pleasures. What it's talking about is this idea of committing a heavy transgression. And what you kind of need to know, if you didn't know this already, is that in that early form of Buddhism, again, the more ascetic, celibate, renunciatory form of Buddhism, it was considered a heavy transgression to have sexual relations. And by heavy, you would actually get kicked out of the Sangha if you if you were a monastic. Now, if you if you weren't, if you hadn't taken monastic vows, that's a different story. But in the early tradition, had you taken the monastic vows, then to have sexual relations would be to go against those. And it's considered one of the big ones. And it's up there with killing someone that gets you kicked out of the Sangha, removed, excommunicated is what we would call it in English. So the point, and by the way, too, there are certain transgressions like murder and killing that is also one of the heavy transgressions. If you commit one of those, you're pretty much guaranteed a trip to the lower realms, a trip to rebirth in a hellish realm. Maybe you'll get by as a hungry ghost. But the idea is, is that there's uh, repercussions for that beyond just getting kicked out of the Sangha. So the way that I read this text, when it talks about a bodhisattva, even if they indulge in the five sensual pleasures, but they have an ultimate compassionate mind, then they don't commit a heavy transgression. And I think it's really important to, to recognize that they are not saying that they don't commit any transgression. They don't commit a heavy transgression like in the old school form of Buddhism. And this is where this idea of the bodhisattva vow, the vow to awaken all sentient beings. The first part of the sutra that I'm, I'm not going to go back and reread, but the first part of the sutra was about how the bodhisattva makes this vow to basically work on the for the behalf of all sentient beings. And the idea that was expressed in this sutra in the first part is that that vow, that's like what makes a bodhisattva a bodhisattva. And that basically, if a bodhisattva were to give up that vow, if they were to give up their commitment to benefit all sentient beings, that would be a transgression. And so this sutra kind of does this thing where it kind of says, well, in the world of the bodhisattva, since they're entirely focused on the welfare of others, it may so happen that they are faced with this kind of problem of keeping the precepts or helping sentient beings out. And the bodhisattva is going to choose to help sentient beings out. And because of that commitment to that vow, 
even though they're going to break this precept, they're not going to hell for it, is the simple way to put this. So that idea of a bodhisattva putting their vow first, I, I think an easier one, like the sexuality one is tricky. We're going to get more into it tonight. So I'm not, I'm not dodging this at all, but an easier one would probably be of the five precepts, the precept against taking what has not been given. So atta dana, taking what has not been danad, not been given, otherwise known as stealing. This, of course, is a classic, you know, um, moral, ethical philosophy question. It's wrong to steal, but if your child is starving, is it still wrong to steal a loaf of bread to feed your child? Which, 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 is, which is worse, letting your child starve or stealing? And this is a classic kind of, again, you know, I, I studied philosophy when I was in college. I took a class on, you know, I guess moral philosophy or ethical philosophy. And this is the classic example. Is it a transgression to steal a loaf of bread if your intentions are to provide <laughs> starving people with that food? Basically, the bodhisattva, it sounds, would. Atadana would take what has not been given if it was about providing it to other people if they were starving. Now, I also made this clear last week, and I want to say it again before we dive any deeper into this. You know, Buddhism, especially, um, there's a lot of books written on Japanese Buddhism regarding morals and ethics. And the idea is, is that Buddhism in a way has a kind of what would be called a relative ethic in that sense, at least the Japanese form, where what we're going for, and another way to think about this is that we are interested in the spirit of the law and not the letter of the law. That would be a way of putting it for the bodhisattva, that they are much more committed to the spirit of the dharma or the spirit of the law than maintaining this strict adherence to the letter of the law, right? And Ananda, by the way, you know, Ananda being this representation of early Buddhism and a representation of like the, the good monk. Ananda has a tendency to represent sticking to the letter of the law in that way. So he makes a good foil for this conversation about our bodhisattva, king honored by all. My point, though, about that idea of the, the spirit of the law versus the, the letter of the law, my point is... I want to kind of really remember that these are stories and that these are not recommendations for behavior exactly. They're actually stories to help us locate the spirit of the law. That's how I read it. And so as we move forward in this, let's keep that in mind that these are stories or allegories in that sense. And as a Mahayana Sutra, this is not an account of historical events that we should kind of, again, base our life on in that way. We're interested in the spirit. So that brings us to the next section, which this whole sutra really kind of like weaves in and out. Oh, is there a question? I'm sorry. Please, 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 please. Um, yeah, can, can you clarify? Are you saying that... Uh monk in the Hinayana tradition would not take a piece of bread that was not given to him in order to feed a starving person. Sorry to put you on the spot, but <laughs> now, yeah. So say that. I, yeah. I, I don't know exactly. It would be a case by case basis. I will tell you this though, in terms of what this sutra is saying, 
in the Hinayana, the early form, as far as I understand it and have studied it, the idea is, is that if a shravaka, a, a, a monk in that way, the idea, karmically speaking, the idea is, is that if they steal the bread, they are going to suffer the karmic consequence of that, period. And their intention is irrelevant. They committed the transgression. And it almost, as far as I have, again, as far as I've studied this stuff, in the Hinayana, it almost actually becomes like kind of a mathematics game as far as you get so many demerit points for stealing the bread, but you get a couple of merit points for giving it to somebody starving. And so your, your, your net karma might even out in that way. But the idea is, is that having taken it, you're not off the hook for that. This sutra is kind of actually saying that karmically it diminishes your the karmic hit you take if your intention is with malice or without malice in that way so yeah all right so again the sutra kind of weaves in and out of these stories and i just want to tell you that as we move ahead what's really interesting is that like, this is not the last that we've heard from Bodhisattva King honored by all. But we are going to take a little aside because the Buddha it now tells, oh, actually he's telling Bodhisattva King honored by all, I think. So the Buddha now says, I remember, I recall that in the past, Countless kalpas ago, countless eons ago, there was a brahmacharin named Sudha, constellation. He cultivated pure conduct in a secluded forest for 4,200,000,000 years. When he came out of the forest, he entered the city called Ultimate Bliss and encountered a woman there. At the sight of this handsome Brahmacharin, the woman's passion was aroused. She went up to him immediately, clasped his feet with her hands, and prostrated herself on the ground. Good man, then the Brahma, good man, she said, and then the Brahmacharan asked the woman, what do you want, sister? The woman answered, I want you, Brahmacharan. The Brahmacharan said, I don't indulge in desire, sister. The woman said, if you don't consent to my demand, I shall die. Good man, uh, uh, Bodhisattva, king honored by all. At that time, the Brahmacharan constellation thought to himself, that is not proper for me to do, especially at this time. I have cultivated pure conduct for 4,200,000,000 years. How can I destroy? How can I destroy my streak now? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thus the Brahmacharan forced himself to leave her. But after he had walked seven steps away, he felt pity or loving kindness for her and thought, you know, I can endure the pain of the hell realms if I fall into them because of breaking the precepts. But I couldn't bear to see this woman suffer so much. I will not let her die. Not for me. And so, with this thought in mind, the Brahmacharan went back to the woman. He took her with his right hand and said, stand up, please. 
You may do as you like. <laughs> that Brahmacharin was married to that woman for 12 years. After that, he left the household life, his household life with her, and immediately regained the four immeasurable states of mind. And then he was reborn in the Brahma heaven after he died. So before I do the big reveal on this, I do want you to know this term Brahmacharin. I did a whole talk about this, I think, last year, but just in case you weren't there, this idea of a Brahmacharin and Charya, Charya means to practice, to cultivate. So it's a cultivator or a practitioner, a Charya of Brahma, a Brahmacharian. And basically, just to tell you very simply, if you see that idea of somebody who is a Brahmacharin, it means they're practicing celibacy. There's a few other criteria that goes into being a Brahmacharin. But the primary one is that you are practicing, uh, if you're a male, you're practicing semen retention, basically. So that's a brahmacharin. And so that's sort of the significance of pointing out that this person had been a brahmacharin for 4 billion, 200 million years, right? So after the brahmacharin, agrees to marry the woman and they live together for 12 years then he leaves home life again and then is eventually reborn in the brahma heaven the buddha says to the bodhisattva king honored by all have no doubt that brahmacharyan of that time was none other than myself the buddha in a former life and that woman was Yashodra. The text says Gopa, but if you read the footnote, it's referring to the Buddha's wife. If you know the story or the life story of the Buddha, in his, in his 20s or whenever, he got married to a woman named Yashodra, and they had a child together named Rahula. And so this is the backstory about how they met. They met in a previous life when the Buddha was a practicing Brahmacharin, and this woman threw herself at him and he agreed to live with her. And so, because the Buddha says, because at that time I took compassion on that woman who was engulfed with desire, I skipped. This is the Buddha talking. I skipped the suffering of one million kalpas in samsara. King honored by all. You see, sentient beings fall into the hell realms because of their lust and desire. But a bodhisattva who practices upaya is reborn in the Brahma heaven, not the hell realms, even if they indulge in lust and desire. This is the upaya practiced by a bodhisattva. Renata. Yes, I, I really have been having to read this as an allegory because it seems to me um, it would be more helpful for the, I mean, the woman would have to have some serious psychological issues if she's um, gonna die, if this guy doesn't have sex with her or sit on a couch with her or whatever that she wants to do. Yeah. That it seems like it would be more compassionate to um, maybe figure out why she has these problems. <laughs> <laughs> and in excellent, Renata. And indeed, that's why we're reading this as an allegory. Because if if this were a real world event, yes, I agree. There would probably be a conversation to be had about her desperate <laughs> her desperation in that sense. So, I agree. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to go further. This, by the way, we haven't heard the last of the Brahmacharin constellation. 
So this Buddha, the Buddha in a former life, we haven't heard the end of him. We haven't heard the end of Bodhisattva King honored by all. All of these little stories are kind of weaving together. So the main Bodhisattva, which I haven't mentioned yet, but the main Bodhisattva that the Buddha's talking to, who he's been talking to since the beginning, is a Bodhisattva named Nyanotara, superior wisdom or superior knowledge. And so all of this, by the way, has been in response to the Bodhisattva Nyanotara's question about upaya. How does a Bodhisattva practice upaya? So then the Buddha tells Bodhisattva Nyanotara, noble one, and so he says to the bodhisattva, you remember, or remember, you know, when Shariputra and Mahamadgulyayana, if, if those two, so if Shariputra and Madgulyayana had practiced upaya, like a bodhisattva, they would not have let the monk called Kokalika untimely fall into hell realms now this is one of those situations where this sutra presumes that you are knowledgeable of all things buddhist right and so it it presumes you already know this backstory i had to go digging pretty deep in a lot of texts to find this backstory but basically there's this story about a monk named Kokalika that means untimely. And the story is, is that, and actually let me see if I can. So yeah, I'll just read. So Shariputra and Madhuyayana who were both, those are both monks from the old school form of Buddhism. Let's remember that. So Shariputra and Madhuyayana had lodged in a potter's house overnight because it was raining, not knowing that there was a woman in the place where they took up refuge. The woman took a bath the following morning because she had had a female nocturnal emission. She had been aroused and had a, a kind of a, a dream in that way. And so she woke up in the morning to clean herself off from the nocturnal emission. The monk Kokalika untimely saw her bathing and accused Madhuyayana and Shariputra, because remember, they took up residence there, not knowing that she was there. So that monk untimely saw her bathing and accused the two venerables of having had an affair with her for his false accusation. The monk was reprimanded three times by the Buddha and he didn't repent. So he suffered much the rest of his life and fell to hell after death. So that's the backstory on Kokalika. And it's very reminiscent of the story with Ananda and the Bodhisattva King honored by all, where there was kind of a misunderstanding going on. So if we jump back now, it says, but if Shariputra and Madhuyayana had practiced Upaya, then they would not have let that monk Kukalika fall into the hell realms by making a false accusation. Why? This is the Buddha talking again. He says, I remember that way back in the era of Krakuchanda Buddha, one of the Buddhas of the past, I remember that in the era of that Buddha, there was a monk named Vimala, undefiled, who stayed in a cave in a secluded forest not far from where five rishis lived. 
like five holy men. One day, dense clouds suddenly gathered, and soon it started raining heavily. At that time, a poor girl was caught walking in the heavy rain. Cold, poorly dressed, and frightened, she entered the cave where monk Vimala, undefiled, was living. When the rain stopped, monk undefiled came out of the cave together with the girl. When those five rishis, the five holy people, saw this, their minds, the five rishis, their minds became perverted, and they said to one another, Monk Vimala, monk undefiled, is deceptive. He's crooked. He's committed an impure deed. At that time, knowing the thoughts of the five rishis, the monk Vimala, undefiled, ascended in midair to the height of seven palm trees, one stacked above the other. When the five rishis saw the monk Vimala levitating or ascending into the midair, they said to one another, according to all the books and scriptures that we have read, a person cannot ascend in midair if they have committed improper deeds. But this guy, he can, if he, he can only if he has cultivated pure deeds. Then the five rishis threw themselves full length prostrated out on the ground before the monk Vimala. They joined their palms together and repented their misdeeds, not daring to hide or conceal them. The Buddha continued telling Bodhisattva Nyanotara, if monk Vimala had, had not resorted to the upaya of ascending in midair at that time, then the five rishis would have fallen bodily into the hell realms right then and there. Oh, and who was monk Vimala undefiled? It was none other than Bodhisattva Maitreya in a former life. So that's our backstory. The upaya was that this monk Vimala, who was being falsely accused, the upaya was for him, for him to levitate into midair. And then the rishis were like, oh, there's no way he could do that if he had committed an impure act. We must have had it all wrong. And so... The monk Vimala performing the upaya of levitation is what saved the five rishis from being reborn in hell. And so you should know if Shariputra and Madhulyayana had resorted to such upaya, like ascending in midair, then monk Kokalika, untimely, would not have fallen into the hell realms. Now you should know that Shravakas, like Shariputra and Madhulyayana, and Pratekya Buddhas, those solitary enlightened Buddhas, they don't have the upaya practiced by Bodhisattva Mahasattvas. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Everybody doing okay with where we're at? Okay. So now we get to a, a fun part. And we're going to have a lot of fun talking about these. So the Buddha has just said kind of what I've been saying kind of all along that upaya, this idea of, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm on page 434 of the yellow book. So the the sutra is basically saying what I was saying, which was that upaya, this skillful means, is kind of solely within, you know, the practice of the bodhisattva. And that's why it was saying that 
Shravakas like Shariputra and Maguyayana and even Pratekya Buddhas, they don't perform upaya. They don't have skillful means. It's solely a bodhisattva thing. And so <clears throat> what we are about to get, what we're about to go over, starting on page 434, we're about to go over six similes, analogies, metaphors, probably similes. Yeah, it's like they're similes, I think, would be technically right. But there are six of these that are talking about the upaya of bodhisattvas. And the first one, I mean, they're all really amazing, but the first one is very interesting. So the Buddha tells Nyanotada <clears throat> as an illustration, consider a prostitute. She has 64 seductive ways. For example, to obtain wealth and treasures, she may coax a man into generously giving her his valuables by pretending that she is going to marry him. And then she drives him away without regret when she has obtained her precious objects. Similarly, a bodhisattva who practices upaya can use their upaya according to particular circumstances. They teach and convert all sentient beings by manifesting themselves in forms that people like and by freely giving them everything they need, even their own body. For the sake of sentient beings, they delight in creating roots of virtue without expecting any blissful karmic results from it. As soon as they know that the sentient beings that they're teaching are cultivating good roots and will not regress in their practice, the bodhisattva abandons them without the least attachment to the five sensuous pleasures which they have pretended to enjoy. <clears throat> this might be what, one of the only times that you hear a bodhisattva being compared to a prostitute. <laughs> so this is a very interesting upaya. And, and actually kind of what I want you to kind of recognize now, in general, something like an analogy or a simile is itself in upaya. But now we have a story, right? Or an analogy that, so what I mean to say is, is that this is an upaya, meaning this is simile is an upaya, and it's an upaya about upaya, if that makes sense. So we're getting kind of uh, recursive in our upaya. It's like upayas stuffed in upayas that way. So there's a lot going on just in this one. Um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to point out, or actually I won't, I won't dwell on it too long, but this is sort of very interesting, this comparison. Now, we have to be very careful with these similes, though, because this is, of course, not saying that a prostitute is a bodhisattva, and it's not saying anything like that. It's actually making a, an, a, an analogy or a simile, and it's saying in the same way that a prostitute has all of these tricks up their sleeve in order to do their business, a bodhisattva has all kinds of tricks up their sleeve too that they do their business with. Now, the, the place where these overlap and where it kind of comes to the, the message of the sutra, it's this idea that they've done this, whatever it is they're doing, which is 
in some way, shape, or form, they are involved with the five sensuous pleasures, right? So they're involved with the five sensuous pleasures, but as soon as they know that the sentient beings that they've been teaching and the reason why they got involved with the five sensual pleasures to begin with, as soon as they know that those sentient beings are cultivating good roots and that they won't regress, the bodhisattva abandons, the, just he's out <laughs> without the least attachment to the five sensuous pleasures, which they pretended to enjoy. That's a key part of this I idea, that idea. And actually, I'll, I was going to share this last week. I'll share it this week. I've been trying to share more personal stories of practice in that way. I did share with everybody last week, sort of my own, a little bit about my own personal journey with the fifth precept. So the fifth precept, as you may know, is the one about uh, inebriation or intoxication, basically about alcohol. And last week in talking about that, I kind of mentioned that, well, basically I, for most of my adult life, I didn't observe the fifth precept meaning I drank. I didn't drink to excess in that way, but I wouldn't say that, you know, it was just one of those things. I was, I was like a lot of people where I drank. At some point, and it was a funny thing, but at a certain point, I just realized that it had been a very long time since I had had a drink. Like it literally, I had some sort of realizations about it almost sort of like insights about it that, that I did share last week. And basically there were insights about how I was really misconstruing what a good time was. <laughs> Meaning that before this, I was really under the impression that sort of feeling a little sick, feeling a little dizzy, you know, what you might call inebriated. I realized like, oh, that's just being sick. That's just being unhealthy. And as soon as I sort of had that feeling about it, it was just no longer pleasurable. It was just one of those things. I feel fortunate for kind of having come to that realization so naturally in that sense where it wasn't really forced upon me. And I never really, uh, again, I didn't observe the fifth precept until I started observing the fifth precept. Now, what I didn't tell you last week, though, is that it had been now many years um, that I hadn't had alcohol. And then I had a friend come, an old, dear friend come to visit from out of town. And this was a, you know, uh, a rare visit. And I hadn't seen the person in a while, so they are you know knew me from before and so they showed up with a bottle of wine and we were making a lovely dinner and it was one of those situations where i just didn't want to bother <laughs> and so as it was at dinner glasses were poured and i had my toast and i had my few sips and I felt like I was doing the upaya thing, actually, where I didn't particularly want to drink, but I was also not so adamantly opposed to it. And I recognized that that group situation would, would have been dampered a little bit. And I was like, you know what? Whatever. And so, in a way, I pretended to enjoy the five sensual pleasures because again, I didn't really want to do it, but I also wasn't opposed to, you know, or I was opposed to breaking the good time in that way. And so again, I had my few sips and in many ways it was actually a, um, I felt accomplished in that sense because I left most of the glass there. <laughs> 
And that for me, the old Michael would never leave uh, any, like, again, I didn't drink to excess, but I liked it, <laughs> I'll put it that way. So I just wanted to share that little mini example of my own personal experience of having basically broken a precept that I had been following, but really felt like my intentions were in the right place in that way. So I'm not encouraging anybody out there to break your precept, but again, we're talking about the spirit of the law tonight. And so for me, that was in the spirit. So, okay. Everybody doing okay? Cool. So that's our first one, our first analogy that a bodhisattva is like a prostitute <laughs> in that way. Interesting. And again, I just want you to notice, because I didn't notice it for a while, I want you to notice how the theme of sexuality keeps coming in and out. Yeah, Noe. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. I, I, I appreciate it now that, that there was dancing, there was singing it with, uh, with uh, King, King Happiness, you know, it was reported he would, or, or the other story with the nun, you know, there's, oh, I saw him singing. He actually was indulging in singing. Oh, he was indulging in dancing. Oh, dancing and singing it's it you know it's it was an upaya thing to help that woman move forward and of course the beautiful poem that he recited to her uh king mm -hmm. honored king by all. honored by all <laughs> mm -hmm. all right illustration number two yeah you yeah, that wasn't a question right noe Oh. Yeah, it was a beautiful observation. Yeah. <laughs> so our second illustration that the Buddha has about the, the Bodhisattva as a practitioner of Upaya, as an illustration, consider a black bee. Although it enjoys the fragrances of all the flowers, it doesn't think of taking up an abode in or becoming attached to any flower, nor does it take away the petals, the stalk, or the scent of any flower when it leaves. In like manner, a bodhisattva mahasattva who practices upaya plunges himself into the five sensuous pleasures in order to convert sentient beings, but Seeing that dharmas are impermanent, they do not think that the five sensuous pleasures are permanent, and so they have no love for them. They hurt neither themselves or others. So the bodhisattva is like a bee going from flower to flower, but not getting attached to any flower in that way. Next up, as an illustration, consider a small seed. When it produces sprouts, it does not lose its original qualities, but it produces, and it doesn't lose its original qualities and produce a sprout that's alien to its nature. Likewise, though bodhisattvas may have defilements and may amuse themselves with the five sensuous pleasures, still, because they have the wisdom seed of emptiness, characteristiclessness, desirelessness, or what they call non-action, and non-self. So if, as long as they have the wisdom seeds of emptiness, characteristiclessness, desirelessness, and no self within them, they will not fall into the miserable planes of existence. They will not lose the qualities of their roots of goodness or regress from their pursuit of enlightenment. Okay, so this is one 
Yeah, since we have a little bit of time, I do want to take a moment to do a little bit of Dharma discussion that pertains to the earlier part of the sutra. So this example of the bodhisattva as being like a little seed and the the buddhists in in sutras they use this example a lot it's the example that if you plant like uh, you know they use a lot of different versions of it but it's the idea that if you plant a mustard seed you won't get a magnolia tree and they use that as an example to talk about karmic seeds and the idea that if you plant the karmic seed of of you know hatred for example you're not going to get beautiful lovely flowers <laughs> out of that seed so the seed turns into its appropriate uh, karmic sprout in that way so that's a pretty classic buddhist thing to talk about this is saying the same thing where it says consider a seed when it produces a sprout the sprout is an alien to its nature in that way and then it says likewise bodhisattvas may have defilements and may amuse themselves with the five sensuous pleasures. But because they have the wisdom seed of these four things, emptiness, characteristiclessness, what it calls non-action, and then finally non-self. I want to talk about those for a second because they do kind of reinforce the underlying dharma of all of this so usually we only hear about three of these the first three of them you will often in mahayana sutras especially this collection of sutras you will often hear what are called the three doors of liberation shunyata emptiness, animita or alakshana, uh, characteristiclessness, and then apranihita, which is really tricky to translate. It's translated as desirelessness or aimlessness. They're translating it based upon the Chinese as non-action. And then the fourth of those is no self, non-self. So I won't go too deep into it, of course, because I've talked about it so much, but, you know, the underlying teaching here is about this idea of emptiness, this teaching about things not having inherent nature, right? And I'm not, again, I'm not going to launch into a deep teaching about that. But the idea is, is that if you really understand the empty nature of things, then you can understand how they are characteristic lists. And I'm, you know, I'm really resisting launching into my normal talk about emptiness and characteristic listness. I'm going to refrain. If you don't know these deeper teachings, please go back and listen to some of my earlier talks. But the idea here is, is that the teaching of the emptiness of all phenomena, the teaching of like, you know, characteristiclessness, for example, an easy way to think of characteristiclessness, it's something like beautiful. Beauty. That's a characteristic, right? If you were to describe something, you might describe it as beautiful, or you might describe it as ugly. And the idea is, is that you, you would say, or you would probably think that like, you know, I'll take my, my screen that I always have behind me here. You might think it's pretty. You might think it's tacky. <laughs> you might think it's ugly. Those are characteristics. That's what we're calling lakshana or characteristics, like that it's beautiful or it's ugly. But of course, what we know is that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. We know that beauty, that we know that this, or wisdom tells us, this screen, it's neither beautiful nor ugly. 
it actually doesn't have that aesthetic characteristic. Beauty is in the person perceiving it, but not in the thing itself. So the idea here is, is that if you can really get into that teaching, the teaching of emptiness and the teaching of characteristiclessness, again, that's the underlying philosophy or dharma of the bodhisattva. And then I'm going to talk about the third door of libera liberation really quickly, what they call non-action. But again, it's usually a pranihita, desirelessness. But this particular idea, yes, it's about bodhisattvas sort of being desireless, like not having the craving, not having the tanha that desire, it's sort of about that, but it's also about, and this is where it's a little deeper than that, it's also about how, well, we tend to desire, we tend to want beautiful things, just as an example. So, Desire, wanting, might be for something beautiful. But wait a minute. We just talked about how things are not beautiful. <laughs> they, don't, they actually don't have that characteristic. So when the bodhisattva understands emptiness and understands that things don't have the characteristics that we think they do, the bodhisattva, out of that wisdom, realizes that things are then desireless because it was only the characteristics that we wanted. And if those things don't actually have those characteristics, then they are the bodhisattva understands that they are no longer actually desirable in the way that we thought they were. But there's one more deeper level to the third door of liberation, this apranihita. Usually the teachings of the third door of liberation, it's about having desire for a better rebirth. It's about having a desire to be born in a better situation, to be born in a heavenly realm. And the idea is, is that a bodhisattva understanding emptiness, understanding characteristiclessness, understanding no self, which is the fourth that the Buddha mentions here, understanding all of that, the bodhisattva is not playing the rebirth game in, as far as accumulating merit or accumulating punya in order to get a better rebirth. The bodhisattva is desireless when it comes to such things. Now, I always like to insert in here, whenever we get to talking about reincarnation in Buddhism, I always like to remind everybody, if you're not into like, you don't believe in that reincarnation business, doesn't matter. You don't have to believe in reincarnation. In fact, it's as far as Buddhism goes, it's probably better if you don't believe in reincarnation, frankly. But let me translate, because I know that reincarnation is kind of more of this Indian cosmological view. So we could also put it not as far as the desire for a better rebirth, we can look at it just in terms of the desire that in 10 years, I'll be in a bigger house with more money and whatever, whatever. That is basically rebirth in a higher realm 10 years from now. And my point is, is that the bodhisattva, understanding emptiness, characteristiclessness, and no self, 
is not striving for such worldly, mundane creature comforts in that way, is not striving for that. Their efforts are entirely about benefiting all sentient beings. They are not looking out in that way. Now, don't anybody get confused out there. It's not that the Bodhisattva is a doormat for everybody to walk over. It's not anything like that. We're talking about material desires, the desire for material gain, material wealth. And a bodhisattva is valuing sentient beings awakening. That is like the highest value to a bodhisattva is sentient beings learning, maturing, and eventually being awakened. A big house, that's just a lot of trouble. That's just a lot of, you know, a uh, lot to take care of in that way. So bodhisattva is not interested in those things. Is interested in saving all sentient beings. Noe. Thank you. My uh, quality, first time here. Thank you. For the oh, program. hi. Yeah. Uh, very good. Uh, I have a two questions. Um, maybe if you don't mind. I guess the first one is I always, when I try to engage this type of Dharma, I guess, sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Um, one is I sort of get stuck on thinking about this uh, sort of desirelessness, desirelessness, um, no self. It seems like there is a boundary between the spiritual realm and the material realm. Because one question I have is when people talk about meditation, they're like, don't, don't be too obsessed with where you are in the progress. Like how clear your mind is, how calm you are, because the more obsessed you are, you're just not, you're really not in the present moment. I feel like, how do you reconcile that with the Bodhisattva genuinely cares about other people's enlightenment, but if it's, is, is there in some sense someone's being enlightened or not is a fundamental nature of that person as opposed to the, the screen being pretty uh, or not? Uh, it just sounds like you will believe the screen doesn't really have that inherent nature, whereas the, the, a person's state of enlightenment does. So that's, I guess, my first question. Um, the second question I'll just tag on a little bit, maybe as a side note. When I was listening to your stories from the sutra, it kind of dawned on me, it, it seems a little silly in some way that maybe this is an allegory, but still, it seems like these individuals are not taking responsibility of their own mm. behavior somehow. Somehow, uh, this Bodhisattva is babysitting the person, right? For example, this uh, monk, um, Buddha is like, well, if they practice Upala, this person will go to, will not go to health. But uh, they, uh, yeah, yeah. If they don't practice, if someone, this mm. person believed that the, the Bodhisattva was sleeping with a the person, therefore he will go to hell. It seems like, wow, like it sounds like this person should be responsible for their own judgments. So, why is it that the Bodhisattva? Mm. Uh, it seems like they are taking responsibility over it. How should I think about that? So those two, thank you. Great questions. Yeah. Let me, I'm just writing down a couple of things so I don't forget. So let's see. So the first, your first question, which I'm, kind of already having a little trouble remember the exact way you phrased it. I remember what my answer was going to be, but I don't <laughs> fully remember the question. I, I do, though. So one of the things that I'll mention, and I'm going to, if, uh, by the way, sir, if I don't answer your questions with these, please come back and, and ask for more or, yeah. So one of the things that's going on here, again, regarding your the first part of your question, a lot of what I was just talking about as far as the being reborn in a better rebirth or even in 10 years having this kind of better life in that way, what we're kind of talking about in that regard is a general kind of striving 
but that underlying that striving is this craving or wanting and the idea here is and this is you know we talk, I talk about this a lot on Sunday nights, but the basic idea, one of the basic ideas of Buddhism, as I understand it, one of the ideas is, is that, so we're sitting here now, you're sitting over there, I'm sitting here, so we're here, and there's a way in which, according to the Dharma, there's this way in which we could we could get it in our heads that I could be happier if. So there's this idea, you know, we call it the idea that the, the grass is greener on the other side. So the idea is, is that we get it in our heads that I'm not content with just being here now. There's a sense, no, no, I need more. I need to be watching something or I need to be sleeping with somebody or I need to be, you know, we need to be doing more, then I'll be happy. But just sitting here, just being, that's boring. That's like, I, I need more. And so a, a general teaching of Buddhism is that it's that very striving, it's that very wanting that is making us uncomfortable and ultimately suffering in that way so the basically i'm kind of summarizing the four noble truths in my own kind of way that sent in that sense so there's this idea that the problem is this kind of striving and wanting and and it could be even striving or wanting enlightenment striving or wanting all sentient beings to awaken all of that if it could, whatever it is striving or wanting or craving the situation to be other than it is in this very moment in that sense that's going to be generating this dukkha this suffering now the idea is and this is an analogy that is in a um <clears throat> it's in a buddhist text and it's a really great analogy for the path. And what it is, is it's this analogy of, and I use this one all the time. So everybody's going to be like, here he goes again with that one. But it's the analogy of somebody being lost in the woods. And the idea is, is that they don't know north or which way south or east or west. And so they're lost. And they're striving and they're wanting and craving to get unlost. So they're desperately trying to figure out which way is north, which way is south, which way is east. What the Buddha says is that the moment the person doesn't care where they're going, they're no longer lost. Just like that, boop, no longer lost. And what I like to point out is that if I were lost in the woods and I were desperately trying to find my way home in that sense, if somebody walked by and said, oh, that way is south, then I would have obtained knowledge. Oh, that way is south, I live north, thanks. And now I would be on my way home I would be unlost because somebody told me something and I attained some knowledge. So that's one way of getting unlost is it attaining something. But notice that we had to rely or depend upon somebody else to get ourselves unlost in that way. But the Buddha's way, where the Buddha says, you know, the, the moment you don't care where you're going, you're no longer lost. And what's great about that is we, we, we de-lost ourselves. No, we unlost un ourselves. So it wasn't that somebody else helped us get unlost. We did it all by ourselves. And we didn't need to get anything. What we actually had to do was 
let go. Let go of that striving or wanting to know which way is north, south, east, or west. So that is sort of a, a way of thinking about the bodhisattva's mindset, which is that they have relinquished in that sense. They're not striving or wanting or craving in that way anymore. They're unlost. They're good with where they are. But the, the practice of the bodhisattva, and this is going to lead us into the second part of your question, so maybe I ha will have said something <laughs> to, to address those great questions. So the bodhisattva being unlost in that way, they just have this kind of great compassion for all sentient beings. And it would seem like it would seem like the bodhisattva is out there telling people where north, south, east, and west are, but the bodhisattva is actually out there trying to encourage people to unlose themselves, True. giving them the tools and the wisdom to unlose themselves. So that's sort of the, the way that this works as far as that the bodhisattva, it's not that they have this desire to awaken all sentient beings the way that i think of it is <laughs> they're kind of like not doing anything better with their time in a way but by which what i mean is because they have put down all of the concern for their own enlightenment in that way that they're not striving for it they have just time for everybody else if that makes sense. I saw you got the mic, so yeah, please uh, yeah, talk to me. <laughs> yeah, I just want to, uh, yes, thank you. This is actually very, very uh, useful. I, I just want to add, um, I'm guessing in, in that case, try to resolve my second question. In the example where the monk walked out of the cave with a girl and the, the holy man first accused him of having slept with her, and he levitated, right? So I guess I was interpreting in some kind of more shallow way as in, oh, you know, he kind of told them I did not sleep with her and somehow they don't suffer, somehow they, they don't go to hell. But it sounds like you're pointing to maybe maybe this monk is doing something deeper, which is by showing this fact, maybe it helped these holy men ground themselves better not just like oh okay great he didn't sleep with a girl oh i go to heaven right it, it's nothing that simple it's more like give them a tool to understand nature in a better way and therefore down the road maybe they they have a better chance of uh you know ha have a have a happy life or enlightenment or something like that excellent excellent read of the story i would i would support that reading 100 percent. absolutely um, in fact, um, I meant to say something earlier, and your comments kind of remind me of it. And so this is a little out of order. This is sort of something from the earlier part, but I don't want to miss this opportunity. I think this is actually, it would be very um, upayic, very skillful of me to introduce this idea. So with all the stories or the few stories that we've read so far, but basically these stories about Ananda calling out the Bodhisattva King honored by all, and then the five holy men calling out the monk for sleeping with, or seemingly sleeping with the woman in the cave. There is an interesting parallel uh, uh, for the, the message of these stories there's a really interesting parallel in from the Bible, from the New Testament. One of my favorite Jesus quotes, one of my favorite quotes from the New Testament, it's from Matthew. I don't, I can't remember. It's early on in Matthew. I can't remember exactly the verse. I'm not a, a Bible person in that way where I can recite chapter and verse, but it's a quote that I'm sure you know, and I'm going to paraphrase the quote, but the Jesus quote that I really love is it's about not, not pointing out the speck of dust 
in your neighbor's eye and forget about the log that's in your own eye. <laughs> the plank, I believe, is the normal translation. Like, don't point out the speck of dust in your neighbor's eye and forget about the plank that you've got in your eye, right? And there's a funny thing about that quote as far as that I think the message of that quote is very similar to the teachings that the Buddha is giving to Ananda and to the other bodhisattvas where Ananda is really pointing out not even a speck of dust in the bodhisattva's eye because the bodhisattva didn't even have that speck of dust. But it's definitely kind of a message about that a little bit in terms of the, well, that kind of idea that going around criticizing people and kind of calling them out on their transgressions might not be the best activity in that sense. There's just a kind of another really interesting parallel, though, because, you know, Buddhism, I don't know if you, you know this, but, but you might. Buddhism has a, a kind of uh, a long, very long standing from the earliest form of the tradition all the way into the Mahayana. They have a long standing kind of metaphor of talking about ignorance and delusion Thank you. Matthew 7, 3 it is. Awesome. So they have this metaphor for delusion and ignorance as being like dust that has settled on our eyes. And what they talk about the practice as is clearing the dust from our eyes so that we can see clearly. Interesting overlap and parallel to the idea of pointing out the dust or the little speck of dust in your neighbor's eye. So, okay. Speaking of Jesus and the gang, there's going to be another interesting parallel here, which is yeah. it's going to be a fisherman uh, illustration or a fisherman analogy. And of course, Jesus loved his fishing analogies, right? So, Another illustration, and this will be probably our last one for tonight. Consider a fisherman. He rubs his net with bait and casts it into a deep river. When his wishes are fulfilled, he hauls it out. In the same way, a, a bodhisattvas who practice upaya Cultivate a mind with the wisdom of emptiness, characteristiclessness, desirelessness, and no, and no self. They knit a net of this wisdom. Rub it with the bait of the aspiration for all-knowing wisdom and cast it into the filthy mire of the five desires. When their wishes are fulfilled, they haul it out of the realm of desire. And at the end of their life, they are reborn in the Brahma heaven. So I love the line, knitting a net of wisdom. It's such a, a, a beautiful analogy. So, um, any questions about that one? That one's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, let's do another, maybe even another. Let's see how it goes. So another illustration. Consider someone well-versed in spells, magical incantations. If they are caught by an official, and bound with five cords, they will, by the power of their incantations, soon break the cords and go away at will. In the same way, though bodhisattvas who practice upaya join sentient beings and amuse themselves with the five sensuous pleasures, they do so in order to deliver those beings. 
when their object is obtained is attained, they will, by the spell of all knowing wisdom, break the bondage of the five sensuous pleasures and be reborn in the Brahma heaven. <clears throat> All right, and why not do it? So the very last illustration, as another illustration, consider a fighter, a warrior, who hides a sharp knife. He, who hides the sharp knife that he carries, and he escorts a group of travelers. None of the travelers know this man's secret stratagem. They despise and pity him, showing him no respect. And they say to one another, he doesn't have a weapon. He doesn't have a partner. And he's not even strong or powerful. He can't save even himself from danger. How could he help others? It is absolutely impossible for him to defeat any robber. He will certainly run into trouble. When a pack of robbers suddenly appears from an uninhabited marsh, the fighter stands ground firmly and at once draws out his hidden knife. With one stroke, he kills all the robbers. And then he again hides his knife that he carries. In the same way, bodhisattvas who practice upaya hide well the knife of wisdom, and join sentient beings, amusing themselves with the five sensuous pleasures as a upaya in order to convert sentient beings. When people who do, do not know this to be a skillful means, and they see those bodhisattvas amusing themselves with those pleasures, they become, those people become defiled in mind, and they pity the bodhisattva and think of them to be dissipated, saying such people can, can't even save themselves from samsara, let alone other sentient beings. It's absolutely impossible for them to defeat Mara. However, the Bodhisattva is skilled at upaya and skilled at using their knife of wisdom. And when they have attained their object of converting sentient beings, they will, by the knife of wisdom, eradicate all afflictions and reach a pure Buddha land. Period. <laughs> all right. So that's going to conclude tonight. Any last minute questions, comments, answers, ideas? Any, anybody with the book will recognize my skillful edit there so all right <laughs> um all right if there's no questions comments answers ideas huh? yeah no i have a question <laughs> it's for me it seems to be pointing at the uh the fourth precept of never lying or scandalizing or, you know, using false speech. You know, all of these keep pointing to that. But I also love the idea of skillful means, uh, you know, that is also layered upon it of being, you know, it's not this way or that way. It's this, it's this, period. Whatever's coming up is is skillful means. And if I if somebody sees me, oh no, he's sitting in a, in a in a thing here, and he's just being lazy and not knowing anything, that's fine uh, because I have no control over that. It's just so it's really wonderful, and I'm going to go home and read it again because it keeps pointing out to that this last little part about the fifth precept or the or the fourth, not talking ill even of myself sure <laughs> thank you yeah no and thank you and you you know uh, excellent point at the end there to remember is that upaya is never prescribed it always arises out of compassion in the moment in that sense so it's why it's a skill
All right, everybody. Thanks again for being here. I hope you enjoyed our little Dharma talk. Um, we're going to keep going with this uh, sutra. There's a lot of interesting little parts to come. And so we'll keep going with this uh, next Sunday. <laughs>